headquarters, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Kelly, thank you and good evening everyone. I'm going to start right off with the introduction of tonight's presenter, Kathleen Nace. Kathleen received her music therapy degree from Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania and her certification in neurologic music therapy from Colorado State University. She is the director of the Creative Arts Therapies Program at the Center for Neurological and Neurodevelopmental Health in New Jersey and has been implementing music therapy services with children diagnosed with neurological and developmental disabilities for over 10 years. She directs multiple social skills groups and individual sessions led by music, dance movement, and arts therapists. In addition, her creative arts therapy team sees individuals in groups in public and private school settings, at community events, and private organizations. Kathleen has conducted research on the effects of music with children with developmental disabilities and is currently designing research studies in the field of neurologic music therapy. Additionally, she has been a consultant for parents and teachers of children with special needs. Kathleen currently serves as the Vice President for the New Jersey Association for Music Therapy. Kathleen, welcome. We are delighted to have you join our webinar family. And without further introduction, I'm going to turn tonight's presentation over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming on to learn more about creative art therapy. And we are going to be talking a little bit tonight about music therapy, dance movement therapy, and art therapy. Just so you know, uh, I am, as Marty said, I'm a board-certified music therapist. That's what the MTBC stands for, and I went on to get a special certification in neurologic music therapy. As she mentioned, I do work for the CNNH, which is located primarily in New Jersey, in southern Jersey, but we also have locations in Wall Township, which is Monmouth County, and in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, and also in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. So on to the presentation. Today I hope that uh, you will learn a little bit more about what all these different creative arts therapies are and how they are used with multiple types of uh, populations, all different people, and also to develop an understanding of how creative arts therapies can be used in designing very therapeutic goals and objectives. And finally, also, I'll be giving you some ideas and resources that you can take back to your schools if you're teachers or to use with your children um, and your different clients. So hopefully you'll start a resource list of different activities that you can do that have a creative arts background. So you'll see throughout my presentation that I highlight a few different types of, a few different definitions. I'm going to focus on a few specific words in each definition. As far as what is creative art therapy, there are six different types of creative art therapies. Art therapy, dance movement therapy, drama therapy, music therapy, poetry therapy, and psychodrama. We will specifically be talking about art, dance movement, and music, as those are the primary ones that are used in this day and age. Uh, the other ones are up and coming, especially drama therapy, but there is less research to support those other types of therapies and less specific um, college university programs. The National Coalition of Creative Arts Therapies has a definition of creative arts therapies, and you can see there that basically the definition is telling you that creative arts therapies are used in many different places with many populations to work on many different goals, and we're going to get into that a little bit more specifically. But one thing to highlight is that we use intentional interventions, and our primary goal is to facilitate a change, a positive change in a person's quality of life. You can find out more information about general creative arts therapies at the website nccata.org. As I mentioned, uh, creative arts therapists can work with people across the lifespan. 
from working with babies to people, older adults with Alzheimer's or other age-related conditions. We work with people in the developmental disabilities, uh, brain injuries. We say at CNNH that we work with neurological, neurodevelopmental, and neurobehavioral populations, which really encompasses pretty much everybody. And as I mentioned, we can work in many different locations. We can work in schools, in rehab centers, in hospitals, nursing care, wherever there is a need and a motivation to participate in, in an art therapy, then we can be there. I'm going to highlight a few different goals that we can use in general. Uh, we work on physical goals, speech language, emotional, cognitive, social goals, all these different domain areas. So as far as physical goals and speech language goals, I have a picture up here of Gabby Giffords. And she actually used neurologic music therapy in her rehabilitation to both work on a physical goal of her regaining her um, ability to walk. They did some gait training using a rhythmic auditory stimulation. And they also used melodic intonation therapy in which she was able to sing before she could speak again. You can actually look up uh, her YouTube videos of her singing, um, I believe she might be singing You Are My Sunshine or something along the lines, where the ability to process a previously known song and kind of fill in the blanks is something that a lot of people with a traumatic brain injury or stroke are able to do. We'll get a little bit more into that. So again, as far as physical goals, we can work on many different things from um, the movement patterns that I mentioned with gait training to decreasing sensory sensitivity, whether it's uh, you have a sensitivity to noises or textures uh, or lights. We can also work on increasing relaxation techniques. Uh, that can be very useful for stress reduction. For speech and language, very general here, we can work on expressive and receptive communication with both people who are verbal and nonverbal. We can use various different um, voice output devices, but also just the creative art therapies in general are a nonverbal way to express yourself. Uh, we work on emotional and psychological goals, such as improving your emotional awareness and emotional expression. A big one that we work on in so many different populations and ages is self-esteem. I guess especially with the younger ages, uh, children and teens, no matter what their diagnosis is, uh, a lot of times if they have any sort of difference, even if it's just a young girl who's wearing glasses, they might get bullied or they might be teased. And this happens with you know, a lot of our children, so they have kind of innate self-esteem issues. And sometimes that's seen as uh, a little bit differently. I'm actually, I'm working with a girl who is seven years old and she's diagnosed with ADHD and she, uh, she is bossy and she's always wanting to be the leader and she wants things done her way. And I have a sense that there might be some self-esteem issues. But when I talked to mom, mom said, no, she's always the leader. She's very outgoing. But the more I talked to mom, the more I found out that her older sister is on a dance team that she's not allowed to be on because she doesn't listen to directions well enough. She was also kicked out of her gymnastics um, performing competition team because of the same reasons. So then the mom started realizing, oh, yeah, there might be some self-esteem issues going on here. And what do you know, yesterday I was working with her and we were doing some emotional expression and, and I asked her, um, as we're playing instruments that sounded sad, I asked her what made her sad. This is only the third time I've met her. And she, very sad look on her face, she said when people make fun of her. And so we had a, t a conversation about the fact that there, you know, there are bullies. So again, there's really a lot of a lot of self-esteem that goes into so many of our populations. As far as cognitive goals, we can work on all of these goals, such as attention, increasing focus on, excuse me, focused, divided, and uh, sustained attention. We can also work on pre-cognitive, pre-academic, and academic skills, uh, executive functioning. So again, any population might need to work on some of these different cognitive goals. And social goals, we do a lot of different groups, social skill groups, 
or even within an individual session, you can work on prerequisite for social skills or social groups as far as relationship development, meaning that we can work on maintaining and strengthening interpersonal relationships. A lot of times we're working on conversational skills, uh, being able to manage a conversation, not dominating the conversation, being able to talk about other people's favorite topics, not just your favorite topic. We work on teamwork and turn-taking and sharing all of these different group behaviors. And finally, some other skills or goals that we work on with the older adults, we're going to work on facilitating reminiscence and life review, teaching pain management skills in the hospitals, and the last one I have here in italics is to develop skills to participate in leisure time activities, and really that's kind of a byproduct of what we do where some people come to us with that goal in mind that they want their child to develop you know, the skills to play piano or to dance. That's a great goal, but a lot of times there's, there's other goals that have to go into developing that skill. So music therapy. As I mentioned, I'm a music therapist, so I, uh, this is kind of my primary area that I love to talk about. I'll try not to talk the whole time just about music therapy. But again, here's the definition, and what I want to highlight is that music therapy is clinical and evidence-based. So many people don't realize that we do have evidence-based techniques, and we are doing research. All of us, all of the creative arts need more research, but there is research out there that shows that we can make significant improvements in certain populations with goals. We write our own individualized goals for each person that we see. And the biggest thing is that it's done by a credentialed professional. There's a lot of music within different hospital programs or rehab programs. And uh, there's different harp players that go into these places um, and musicians on call. And these are wonderful programs. A lot of them are nonprofit volunteers. And the music is having a therapeutic effect on the people that they are playing for. The problem is that you can't call it music therapy. The person who is playing the music doesn't have the background to be able to facilitate uh, psychological goals that might come out of it, physical goals that might come out of this. So you really, if you want to have music therapy in your school or for your child, you want to make sure that they are credentialed professional so they have their board certification. <clears throat> music therapy is as old as the writing of Aristotle and Plato. We all know the, the quote that music can soothe the savage beast. Um, but it really began after the wars in the VA hospitals. And just like what I was just talking about, they sent musicians in to the VA hospitals to play for the wounded or injured soldiers. What happened was that these soldiers had PTSD or various significant physical impairments because of the war, and again, the musicians were not trained in these different areas. They were not able to facilitate a conversation uh, from somebody who had PTSD, and so they saw that there could be more of a detriment done than, than a benefit. So they started the first music therapy degree at Michigan State in 1944, and our, you know, the United States had a few different sections of music therapy, but our uh, one big American Music Therapy Association was only founded just in 1998. So we're new and we're growing. And the, actually, the picture I have here I just think is so interesting that this is in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. It's called the Sounds of Acoustic Recovery, the SOAR program. And it's a music therapy program that is an eight-week program for wounded warriors to learn basic music theory of voice lessons, guitar, and piano. But just as I mentioned in my last uh, goal and objective, that's kind of the byproduct, whereas it's led by a music therapist who can also help uh, with them with their mental and physical health improvements. And it's also an outlet for expression. It was started by a sergeant in 2011 who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he sought out music therapy for himself, and he saw that his symptoms started to subside. His motor skills improved, and his morale was boosted, and his depression was minimized. So they started the SOAR program. So why does music therapy work? Music therapy reaches across time and age. It can be for anybody with any levels of ability. It's very motivating. I say that it's successful, meaning that we provide an errorless learning environment so anybody can participate. 
It provides for self-expression. As I mentioned before, nonverbal self-expression. Music elicits emotions. That's why they have music in the movies. And that's why they have, you know, we listen to certain music after we have a breakup or when we're feeling stressed. It just elicits emotions from us. And it's everywhere. Music is um, going to be at weddings and funerals and birthday parties. And so it's, we're going to come into contact with it no matter where we go. And it's across all cultures, too. I actually I meant to at the very beginning, when I do these presentations in person, if I was to be there with all of you, I would be leading some different experiences. So to kind of start you off with your resource list, uh, the experience that I would do to get everybody involved and kind of break the ice is called the heckler. And what I would do is I would hand out instruments, rhythm-based instruments to everybody, whether it's sticks or uh, drums, anything. Excuse me. Anything that you can, you know, create a, a good rhythm. Probably not shakers, maracas, because those are a little bit less rhythmic. And I would tell you that I was going to start a beat. And technically, this could also work if you didn't have instruments and you wanted to just use your hands and clap, or if you wanted to tap your legs or tap the table. I'm sure in schools, kids would get a, a kick out of being able to tap on their desk, um, and it would be an appropriate time to to do that. So anyway, you would I would provide you with a beat, uh, a pretty simple one. And uh, I would ask everybody to join in with me. And then I would come around, and I would heckle you. And I would try to get you off of the beat by kind of coming up a little bit into your personal space with my drum and, and playing off of the beat and playing louder, maybe softer, maybe trying to talk to you. And so it really tries to work on everybody's attention. You have to focus your attention into your own beat and kind of not listen to me. So it's a fun uh, icebreaker. It's a fun group activity. It works on a lot of different things. Not only the attention, but then we get kids to, or the participants, actually it was developed for adults, um, everybody gets a turn to be the heckler. And then we go back to the self-esteem. It's a fun thing that they get to lead a group, and they get to be the heckler, or the class clown, or whatever the case may be that they're not usually able to do. So. This is what I, I meant by, um, I had mentioned about an errorless learning environment. I usually also ask people if they are, if they would consider themselves musical, and many people do not consider themselves musical, but you don't need to have musical ability in order to participate in music therapy. So why does it really work? I just mentioned all these great reasons why music is great for all of us, but neurologically, why music therapy? This a little bit unorganized slide is meant to be that way to show you all of the different regions of the brain that are used when you are listening to and engaged in music. The primary reason is that music uses both sides of your brain. It uses all of these different lobes and cortexes, such as just listening to the pitch and the volume of music is processed in your temporal lobe. If you are tapping your toe along with the music, you're using your cerebral cortex. You're also using your cerebral cortex when you are listening to the rhythms of the music. Also, when you're listening to the music and you um, have some sort of imagery, whether you're thinking back to, oh, that was my wedding song and I'm thinking about my first dance, or you're thinking about going to the beach, all of that imagery is using a part of your brain. So there's many different, it uses Wernicke's area and Broca's area, and that is why music can really uh, work neurologically. I just said that you don't need to have music ability to participate. That's one of the biggest misconceptions of music therapy. You don't need to have a child that loves music and it's their only thing that they love. They probably like music even if they don't, they're not out out front with it. I actually just have an intake coming up uh, with a 12-year-old who has mood disorder, and mom said that he just doesn't respond to therapy. He doesn't want to go to any more therapies. And I said, well, does he listen to music? Does he listen to the radio? And she said, yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. And I'm like, well, I could probably engage him by at least even talking about what he likes to listen to. And then maybe since he's a teenager, he might like to do some music and technology. We have a, a garage band is a program on the computer where you can take different loops, guitar sounds and drum sounds, and kind of create your own song. 
and we might be able to take those songs that he likes and talk a little bit more about the lyrics and then maybe get into songwriting ourselves and so there's a lot of different levels that you can work on even if he doesn't have you know a musical skill or he's not obsessed with music another misconception is that classical music excuse me classical music such as Mozart is the best music and this kind of came about from the Mozart theory. Uh, I remember hearing back in high school that if I was studying for my SATs and I put the SAT book under my desk then and I listened to Mozart that I would wake up and, and get all my questions right. I'd be so much smarter the next day. And obviously that is debunked. That's not a correct theory. What we do take into consideration are the client's preferences. So in one case, I was working with a boy with a significant stutter, and we were working on relaxation techniques so that he can do them before his uh, class presentation. And I asked him what music he listens to to relax, and he told me Led Zeppelin. And there I said, hey, that's quite possible. I didn't take out a blood pressure machine and actually listen to or see if that is true, but everybody listens to something different to relax. The same way that a lot of people listen to more upbeat and fast-paced music when they are working out, I specifically like to listen to more laid-back acoustic guitar music because it gets my mind off of the pain that I feel in my joints. So we also take into consideration the various circumstances, um, meaning if we are asking my group, I do a group at a um, at alternative school for children with emotional and behavioral disabilities, and if I ask them what their preferences are, nine times out of ten I probably won't be able to use them in a school environment due to the explicit lyrical content. But if I explain that to the, the students and I say that I respect what they you know, prefer, but we need to take into consideration where we are, then you know, we can usually find something that we can use. And finally, whatever the client's goals are. A lot of times music therapists will create our own music, will write our own songs so that uh, we can really delve into the client's goals. And the last misconception that I have here is that it's not for people who are healthy. Um, really, music is just part of everybody's life. You know, I listed these few things. We know that children uh, learn their ABCs through music. And there's a lot of research that shows that music training and just practicing of an instrument increases the neural connections, and I just mentioned the various regions of the brain, because it's associated with <clears throat> creativity, decision making, complex memory. Uh, when you're practicing or you're participating in a group, it requires attention, coordination of all different senses. Uh, we mentioned that it triggers emotion. It involves different cooperation with other people, your other band members, members and it provides immediate feedback. It's a, like an instant gratification. And really, music has been shown to trigger the reward area of the brain. So it's really, it really can be used with everybody. So there's two different types of music therapy specializations, which I won't go too deeply into, but I wanted to mention, actually there's more than two, but the, the two specifically that we use here are neurologic music therapy and Nordoff robbins based music therapy. Neurologic music ther therapy is, as it says, based on a neuroscience model. And when I talk to people, I say that this is based on all evidence-based research. It was actually developed in Colorado State University by Dr. Michael Tout. And he developed the three different areas that they work on, the sensory motor, speech language, and cognitive, specifically for the rehab population. So as I mentioned before, like Abby Giffords, the stroke, TBI, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, there are multiple different techniques under each domain area, and each of those techniques has been completely research-based and evidence-based. And we use the rational scientific mediating model and the transformational design model in order to develop our goals. This basically is saying that we look at the influence of music on the non-musical brain and the behavior function and also the clinical research models. And the transformational design model says that we, are, we do an assessment and we look at those non-musical areas, the goal areas, and what the functional therapeutic exercises would be, such as walking. Okay, so that's your, your goal is to be able to walk 
with a better cadence. And then we put them, after we develop that non-music goal, we put the music to the goal. And then after the music, we have a certain um, percentage that you have to meet, you know, your, your cadence. And then we generalize it, again, without music, because you're not always going to have music with you when you're walking. Okay, so the Nordoff Robbins music therapy is kind of the other end of the music therapy spectrum. This is, while there are research articles out there, a lot of times they're more uh, case uh, studies, because this is more based on an improvisational model. It is based on the belief that everybody can uh, has a sensitivity to music, and we can use that to engage various clients uh, to help them with their various expressive skills, their imitation skills. And basically, the music therapist is using improvisational music. They're making it up a lot of times as they go to meet the client where they are in order to then get them to a higher level of interaction. Now, each of these categories, music, dance, and art, I am going to just spend a quick minute focusing on the benefit of movement disorders because a lot of the things that I've previously said have more to do with the ADHD, anxiety, autism population, and there are such specific reasons why the creative arts can work with various movement disorders. And we know that one of the possible causes of, uh, let's say, tics with people with Tourette's is a low level of blood oxygenation. And it's shown in clinical studies that singing has been uh, used to increase oxygenation in the bloodstream. Also, there's a possibility that uh, tics are increased with various levels of stress. And we know that uh, the music can provide a positive impact on hormones and neurochemicals responsible for controlling our stress reactions. We also can use singing to work on regaining fluent speech over time. And that actually goes back to neurologic music therapy. There's various techniques for voice, uh, voice disorders and can also be used then for regaining a fluency in your speech. And finally, with just using instrumental and vocal music, people with Tourette's can find different ways of controlling their tics. And I have here a picture of Matt Giordano. Some of you might have already seen him on YouTube. He's got a lot of followers, I guess. And Musical Mind is a documentary that was based on Oliver Sacks and his works. But Matt Giordano has Tourette's, and he says that he, when he plays the drums, it's like, afterwards, it's like his brain was a puzzle and the pieces were in place and then everything clicked in the two hemispheres of my brain and I felt it go down my entire body. So basically he has you know, significant tics and he plays the drums. You'll have to look him up if you haven't seen him. He plays so hard and so intense and when he's done, he's actually out of breath, but then he goes through a period of time that his whole body is relaxed and he doesn't have any tics. Okay, so here's just a few more ideas and resources for you. Um, the songwriting, the piggyback, I'm actually, I'm actually going to give you some examples here. There is, piggybacking is taking a, an already known song, uh, something very simple, and rewriting words to make it uh, to, the, to the tune of something. Uh, there's a lot of you know, YouTube videos that are spoofs on different things. It's kind of like that. So one, I have a book here that I show teachers that they usually like uh, called Smelly Locker. It's called Smelly Locker, Silly Dilly School Songs by Alan Katz, K-A-T-Z. And this is uh, all different songs that are piggyback songs. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and sing one for you here. So this is called Smelly Locker, and it's to the tune of Frere Jaca. Smelly Locker, Smelly Locker, poor hygiene. Foul and mean, meant to do it sooner. Is this a glove or tuna? Time to clean, time to clean. Excuse my raspy voice here. But basically you get the idea. It's kind of a spoof on different songs. So you can you know, use something like this. We also, as I mentioned, music therapists will write their own songs. I was working with a group uh, at a special ed school, and it was a group of teenage boys who were um, learning self-care skills, self-hygiene skills, because they were getting old and their parents wanted them to do it themselves. So 
I had developed this one song um, to the tune of Hound Dog about putting deodorant on, and that was kind of funny. But another one I developed was to the tune of Happy Days, and it went Sunday, Monday, every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day, Thursday, Friday, every day. I am clean. I am clean. I just want to be clean. First thing I do is take a shower, and I need to use the soap. So anyway, it continues with basically a, a list of what you need to do to be clean. And, you know, this is just something to kind of be catchy and, and help somebody, you know, remember their, their different steps and using deodorant and things like that. So that's songwriting, piggybacking. I mentioned the heckler to you. Music Olympics is kind of a fun thing that you can do as a group. And I've done it where we've just taken different musical events that we make up. We've, we've done uh, Name That Tune could be a part of Musical Olympics. We've done a harmonica game where they, we had to see who could kind of blow the longest into a harmonica, make the longest note. So you can kind of think outside the box and think of various musical-based uh, ideas for Music Olympics. I listed some recommended musicians for you. These are mostly for kids. Uh, Mother Goose Rocks is great. I didn't talk about this before uh, with preferences and circumstances, but a lot of times some of the children who have uh, more complex needs, um, they might grow older and like the music of their childhood. So, for instance, I was working with what we called our sensory class uh, of 18 to 21 year olds in a school, and they were always listening to Barney. And I asked the teachers, you know, I kind of got on a little soapbox and I said, listen, this isn't really age appropriate. And they told me that it's what the kids liked. And I said, yeah, but is it what they like because they were never shown, never given the choice of anything else? And I asked them to please at least move to Raffi because he's a human being who plays the guitar as opposed to a purple dinosaur who sings. But then I found Mother Goose Rocks, and you'll have to look it up. It's really amazing. They take popular songs, and they spoof the name of the singer, and then make the song sound somehow sound just like the popular singer, but also keep the uh, familiarity of the song. So, for instance, there's a, there's a rap um, by who they call Peanut Eminem. Uh, it sounds just like Eminem's 8 Mile, but it's uh, Five Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed. So there's all different ones like that. Uh, there's some recommended websites there. West Music is where I purchase all my instruments from. Uh, I'm very loyal to them. They have the kind of the best quality for the best price. Nancy Music is amazing, especially if you're a musician at all, because she provides the sheet music for all of her different song activity ideas. Songs for Teaching is amazing, especially for teachers who maybe aren't musicians. You can go on, and there's so many different categories. There's songs for singing. I mean, I'm sorry. There's songs for science and math, all different categories. You can listen to a 30-second clip, see the lyrics, and then you can purchase it if you want. And then if you want any more information about how to find a music therapist or kind of looking at frequently asked questions or you want more research on music therapy, you can go to our national organization website, uh, musictherapy.org, or specifically njamt.org is the New Jersey Association of Music Therapy. Okay, so I think I spent too much time talking about music therapy, but now we can talk about art therapy. So. Art therapy, again, you can see in the definition that it can work with many different people for many different goal areas. Okay. Adrian Hill, he is the first person to have been acknowledged as using the term art therapy to describe the therapeutic application of image making. He had tuberculosis, and while he was recovering from tuberculosis in the hospital, he was an artist, and he saw the benefits of drawing and painting while he was recovering. So he saw the value of art, uh, and he said that it completely engrossed the mind as well as the fingers, and it released creative energy of the frequently inhibited patient. So he felt that it enabled the patient to build up a strong defense against his misfortunes. And then the programs were started in the 1940s in the United States. Why would you use art as therapy? Well, as it says here, you can use art you know, as a nonverbal way to express various emotions, um, to work on relieving stress and tension, 
And because it's that nonverbal way to express yourself, the art therapist can interpret the different metaphors within the art to use it as a mode of self-discovery and really increase your own insight and your own awareness to your feelings. Uh, the art therapists are trained in, in interpreting these nonverbal symbols. And again, the benefits of art therapy for movement disorders, well, we know that people with movement disorders many times have other things that they are also working on, such as, as uh, maybe bipolar, um, mood disorders, depression, things like that. And as I mentioned, you can really use art as a way to explore your feelings. Again, with the self-esteem, we use art for developing self-esteem. Uh, we also use it for just stimulating the various neurological pathways, as I've mentioned with our uh, music therapy, very similar. And for your resources here, um, I was actually going to ask you to do a quick activity, but um, I'll explain it instead, and that's the dot-to-dot -dot pictures. So this is, again, another fun kind of icebreaker. And you would ask people, uh, your group or whatever the case may be, to close their eyes and just put dots all over the page. And they don't know why. Don't tell them it's a dot-to-dot -dot picture. Just make dots all over the page. And then when they open their eyes, they have to connect the dots. So they can either connect the dots or you can have them switch with somebody and somebody else has to connect their dots and try to create something. So they have to really think outside the box, which is very difficult for some people. And then if you're in a group, a classroom, you can ask people if they want to share or you know, they can keep it to themselves. That's a big thing, you know, especially if you're not an art therapist, you don't want to dive too deeply into the psychotherapeutic aspect of some of these things. But again, most, you know, most of the time you'll get something kind of concrete. Superhero self-portrait is another very fun thing to do where you ask somebody, you know, it's very difficult to ask somebody to draw a self-portrait. So if you ask them to draw themselves as a superhero, when I do this activity, I basically draw myself as a stick figure and then duplicate myself a few times, and I say that my superpower would be that I can clone myself. So this one I really think uh, encourages some discussion. You can ask people what their superpowers are and kind of go from there. Different websites you can use, kinderart.com and arttherapyblog.com. And again, here are the links if you want to find an art therapist in your area. You can go to arttherapy.org or the New Jersey Art Therapy website, njarttx.org. And finally, dance movement therapy. Uh, the activity that I would use to do an icebreaker for dance movement therapy really focuses on the fact that it's not specifically dancing. I think a lot of people get hung up and they just think that it's dance, but it's really the use of the movements of the body. So we use a game called Crazy Ball, and the first thing you do is you, I would get a few volunteers, maybe five or six, and I would throw the ball, a very soft ball, to somebody and I would say their name. And I would ask them to then throw it to somebody else and say their name and kind of go around in no particular order, not around in a circle. And then we would do it again and I'd ask them to do the same pattern. So then I would introduce a second ball. And so there'd be two balls going around and a third ball and a fourth ball, as many you can, as you can get to. And it takes a lot of focus, a lot of eye contact. It's a lot of fun. It's good for teamwork. And uh, so that's kind of our, our icebreaker game. But again, you want to use very soft balls, of course. So dance movement therapy really came, started around the turn of the century. If you think about it, Dance has always been around and has told stories through the emotion, but it also, as far as ballet and uh, point, was a very structured, a very um, rule-based and, and posture-based activity where there wasn't so much expression, um, not personal, personalized expression. So around the turn of the century, uh, a few dancers really started seeing how you can express yourself and be more individual with your movements. And this is when they started uh, looking into the use of dance movement as therapy. Dance movement therapists uh, use observation and assessment to do their research and to provide the therapeutic intervention. Uh, they see movement as something that can be used to communicate and is very symbolic. And you can use this as a very pure form of working with somebody who has low muscle tone and is building strength, or 
uh, our dance movement therapist works with a few girls who have anxiety and just being able to express yourself through your body whether if you're not a dancer especially is difficult but if you can find that uh, confidence to do so it really can assist you in your development and she actually I have we have another client who is a 15 year old with a mood disorder and depression and she was referred to me with the statement that she does not want anyone to tell her anything else about coping skills. She had obviously had it up to here with psychologists and therapists, but she was a dancer. And she had you know, been taking some breaks from dance because of you know, everything that was going on. So I brought her in and I asked her to just meet with my dance movement therapist just to talk about it. What is dance movement therapy? Maybe it's something she'd be interested in in the future for a career. And she just felt an instant connection with my dance movement therapist because they shared the same uh, awareness of the different stress in her dance life, um, the stress on your body, and then also could talk about how you can use it as a way to communicate and express yourself and also as a, a way to uh, relax. And that brings us to yoga. Uh, yoga is a huge way for, that everybody, everybody, a lot of people use to relax and manage their stress. But if you think about the other goals that it has besides just the building of the muscles, is that um, it can you can work on increased body awareness and posture and focus and control. We did yoga with a group of 12 6 to 10 year olds with ADHD and their parents thought I was crazy when I said I was going to try it but they ended up loving it and the pictures that I got of this group of boys each standing on their own dot we didn't even have mats for everybody we had circles and they were each on their own circle in a tree position the parents could not get over the fact that they could stand still long enough to <laughs> attempt this so that was really really great now as far as the benefits of dance movement therapy on, on movement disorders I listed here the you know ability to refocus yourself um, it helps to reduce symptoms if you have comorbid ADHD such as hyperactivity and impulsivity so I've mentioned that a little bit um, you can use the relaxation techniques for insomnia and also I know a lot of people who have various tics it produces tension in the neck or in the back so you can use the various types of relaxation and yoga poses to alleviate that tension but also I was actually just speaking with two um, neurologists from North Jersey who use dance movement therapy in their practice and they are movement disorder specialists and it kind of combines, they use dance movement therapists, but they're also using a lot of uh, neurologic music therapy techniques. They use it for uh, rhythmic entrainment for their patients with Parkinson's. And this is the use of rhythm to subconsciously entrain the brain to follow the rhythm. So to either, as I mentioned before, the gait training uh, of somebody with Parkinson's, you'd be increasing their stride length and decreasing their cadence but you can also use it in various exercise programs to make things either more motivational but also to just facilitate a more uh, smooth movement uh, to increase the force of the movement in all different areas like that so your ideas here we have movement telephone which is you know similar to the telephone game but one person starts a movement the next person has to copy the movement and go down the line and, and see if it ends up being the same movement obstacle courses are always fun where you just get a variety of different pieces of equipment or anything that you can find um, and everybody gets a turn to pick what you're going to do let's say you have you know a yoga mat and you have to do a a jump on the yoga mat and then you have to bounce the ball three times and it works on sequencing and attention and cooperation all of that I mentioned the crazy ball body sculptures is when you work with a partner to sculpt and kind of move the other person's arms and legs and kind of tell them what to do with their face without using words in order to express something like a certain emotion and then museum statues is uh, when you have to stand still and then you have the one person who is viewing the museum statues and when that person turns their back the statues are allowed to move but then when they look at you you have to be still so that's another fun game to play and again you can go to find more information or find a dance therapist at 
uh, ADTA.org, the American Dance Therapy Association, or New Jersey, NJADTA.org. And one final thing, uh, we also can provide uh, adapted music or dance therapy. And these are, this is for people who are really specifically looking to increase their skills in music or dance. So we're still working on that process, uh, not the end result of learning the music, the piano, or the dance. There's still all those non-music and non-dance goals. But it does usually have more of a product. So a lot of times people will come to me and say, oh, I want my six-year-old with autism to learn piano. I think they're really good. And, and they're not going to learn from a traditional teacher who follows a curriculum. Uh, somebody who, a little four-year-old, is who has social anxieties or separation anxiety is going to have a lot of trouble or even ADHD or something um, in a group of 25 girls in a dance class. So we're going to help teach those prerequisite skills so that they eventually can go into a regular dance class or music class. And that is uh, the end. I would love to take questions that hopefully you have sent in um, and we can talk more about the, the various questions you have. Kathleen, we're ready to go. Thank you. A lot of really good takeaways there. I'm um, great ideas for parents and educators. So thank you on that. Um, I have a question that's I don't think we've ever been asked this question before. So it's kind of an interesting one. Um, the question is, uh, if I was interested in pursuing a career in this field, how would I get started? And do I need a fine arts degree? So could you just? Yeah. That's a great question. So if you, there's a few different ways you can go. For music therapy, you can get a bachelor's or a master's. If you get a bachelor's degree, um, if you're looking in this area, the Philadelphia area has a lot of good programs, Drexel, Temple, Immaculata. Uh, there's a lot in Pittsburgh. Um, if you're not from this area, you can go on to that music therapy website, musictherapy.org, and it'll list the approved uh, colleges and universities. So you can get your, uh, your bachelor's degree. It's a four-year full-time program and then a one-year internship for six to nine months, actually, depending on how many hours you do. You can also get a music therapy master's degree, and you don't need to have a fine arts uh, bachelor's degree, although it's going to make it probably a lot easier for you. Um, you would just need to uh, probably take a few prerequisites, and then they do have uh, shortened master's degree programs. For art therapy and dance movement therapy, uh, there are no bachelor's degrees. A lot of times they'll come from maybe an exercise science background for dance movement therapy or just a psychology background, um, an art, you know, maybe just an art background. Um, but again, you don't need that. And you would just find a master's program. And a lot of times those are about two years full time. I know like Drexel is a 90 credit program that's done in two years. So it's very intensive. And then you have your clinicals and your internships. So again, you can definitely look on those different websites that I gave you. They probably all have the list of approved colleges and universities. Or you can always feel free to email me, and um, I can help provide some guidance there. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, movement music therapy for the hearing impaired. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that a little? Sure, about um, music therapy or movement therapy? Well, mention both. Movement okay. said movement slash music, so let's talk about both sure. of them. Okay. So music therapy, a lot of people, that's kind of another misconception that you wouldn't be able to use it with hearing impaired. But I actually, when I did my internship at the Maryland School for the Blind, I had two classes that were um, visually and hearing impaired. And we used it in so many different ways. You can use it for um, using a lot of drumming to work on vibrations. Um, and you know, there's, we know that there are famous musicians that were deaf. So you can definitely still use it. In addition, um, music is used with sign language very often, and there are wonderful uh, interpreters that have been, you know, signing various musicals. And so, if you just, you know, put sign to music and songs, you can, you know, show your expression in the same way. As far as the dance movement therapy, um, it would probably take the form of a lot of imitation of the movement. Um, you know, you don't really need to have music on, you know, in order to dance at all. Uh, you can, you know, again, maybe they're going to use rhythms, uh, body rhythms, and just a lot of imitation to help somebody to express themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, 
We've talked a lot about kids, and uh, could you talk a little bit about how this therapy would work? And I'm thinking specifically for Alzheimer's. You talked a little bit sure. about Parkinson's, and there's similarities there. Yes. But how does that work for an, an Alzheimer's? And if someone were advanced, whether that's sure. even a practical thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, music and um, smell are the last two memories to leave us. So there are people with Alzheimer's that, uh, you know, have lost a lot of their memories, but could still hear a song from their past and connect to it. Um, specifically, I was, I was working with a group, and I had a lady um, who did not really communicate anymore. She was in a wheelchair, but her, her son brought her to the music therapy group. Um, and luckily, I didn't know this going into the group, uh, but we were singing a song. I, I can't remember exactly what song it was. And afterwards, he came up to me and said that um, that was her wedding song. And she, oh, wow. during that song, she squeezed his hand and then started whispering the lyrics of the song. And she hadn't spoken in years. So there's those memories that it can just bring back uh, for somebody, wow. even with late stage Alzheimer's and dementia. It's amazing um, if we you know, can connect to their you know, their music, that what it can do. Yeah, wow, that gives you goosebumps to yeah, have that's, that kind that's of a reaction. I was, yeah. I was glad I didn't know that, you know, before, before I finished the group. Definitely brought some tears to my eyes. Yeah. Um, in one of your slides, you mentioned a forensic unit. Would you mm -hmm. say, what is that? What, tell me, address that. So, you know, if you are working in forensics, um, in, you know, in the jails or, you know, a transitional program, um, these people are going to have a lot of emotions going on, uh, whether they are, you know, inc incarcerated um, or if they are, like I said, in a transitional and they're working towards, you know, going back into society. And uh, again, they might not want to sit down and just have a, a talk session with a therapist. So again, this is a way to break down those walls. A lot of times these people also have a lot of walls up. Um, and you know maybe engaging in art therapy or uh, I don't know if, if you'd be using music therapy, I mean movement therapy, but um, art probably would be primary or music therapy to just get them engaged and able to talk um, you know more therapeutically. Okay, so forensic in this case, I always think of forensic as I don't know having to do with dead bodies or yes, something. Yes. Yeah. So so it has nothing. All right. Yeah, not nothing to do with that at all. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, tell me about um, if 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 I don't this the parent is saying if I don't think my school would be receptive to a creative arts program, how would I go about getting a program going in the school? Like, okay, give me some guidance in that sure. direction. So, uh, let me a little disclaimer here on if you're from New Jersey and you're talking about that, and there might be other states that are in our same boat, is that unfortunately the New Jersey Department of Education isn't completely supportive of any creative arts therapy. Um, they don't support it in the budgets of schools as a related or mandated service, but really it is in the IDEA as a um, related service. So. For one, if you you know are a really good advocate and you um, have a good connection with maybe a, a person on your child study team, you can start you know talking to them about it. Um, on the uh, I know on the music therapy website and probably the other ones too, there are um, different research articles that you can pull at least the you know the names of to show your administration. But I would say that the, the way that we work and the best thing that works is to try to get them to allow a creative arts therapist to come in and do a free presentation or a free demo class because the way that they're going to see the benefits of the therapy is to actually see it in, in use. So, um, you know, get a few other parents together and, you know, start advocating for, you know, the fact that these can be used specifically to help your children in their school to meet their IEP goals more quickly. Maybe uh, this individual could work with the PTO or the PTA or something like that and, and mm -hmm. get them to sponsor something like that. Uh, yeah. A way we to bring it into the school. Yeah, you can definitely start with, I mean, it's probably, if there's any administrators on the line, they probably don't want to hear this, but if you start with talking to the parents, um, 
you know, it kind of it works out because then you have more people on your side to talk to administrators. Sure. But when you get that kind of reaction that you had from that woman with Alzheimer's, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's amazing. So, um, yeah. yeah, to see something magic happen would be really nice. Yeah, you know, and it, like I said, if you see it happen, it's definitely more poignant. Um, when I was working with... Uh, in a school I was working usually with a speech therapist and you know they have group mandates and it was difficult for them to year after year be doing cooking groups all the time or different social skill groups so when I came in and, and we would work on their goals specifically they the teachers could not believe how well their class would sit and attend to a music therapy you know group and individually how many of them would respond verbally or use their voice output device um, functionally because they wanted to participate. They wanted to use an instrument. They wanted to request a song. Um, so there's a lot of benefit in, in working with um, speech and OT. I'm actually doing a big presentation at CHOP in a month on collaboration between speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and the use of creative arts therapies. Mm -hmm. um, so. Another question, if my child doesn't have a specific motivation in any one of these creative arts areas, how would, how would a parent know how to direct it or how to point them towards the, the right thing? Well, in many cases this might be difficult because you have to seek out an individual music or dance or art therapist. If you could find a place uh, you know, like the CNNH that has somebody who is the director of a program. Um, what I do is I would bring in that family and do a abbreviated intake for each of those areas because as I, I think I mentioned, um, you might not know what will motivate your child or um, we have, you know, children come in and their parents say that art is the most frustrating thing. They definitely don't want to do art, but then they realize that we could use clay or watercolor, which isn't as structured, and they love it, and that's, you know, huge for them. And I mentioned about music therapy. There's so many different things that we can do in each of these um, areas that, you know, we could probably find something that would motivate them. Um, you know, I, the few kids that I've worked with that that were the hardest to engage were those that really were only motivated by edibles. But you, I mean, usually after a few weeks, they will find something that they like. So again, it's you know, it's thinking. If you don't have somebody that could do a general intake, it's thinking a little bit outside of the box of what your child might um, might be motivated by, or you know, looking back at my slides and thinking what the biggest goal area for you might be, and seeing what might best fit them. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, my advice would be to um, always seek out the therapist and ask for a free trial session because, you know, us therapists, we're always looking for clients and going back to the fact that, you know, if you see it happen, it's going to be more, you know, more motivating for you to continue. So mm -hmm. ask, ask for your free sessions. All right. I think we have time for one more. Um, tell me a little bit about how your services are paid for. Like how does that work? Mm -hmm. So... Specifically at the CNNH, our services can be paid for by insurance. And this is because uh, we work under medical uh, doctors. And because it's a medical facility, we can use medical insurances. Um, the codes that we use are similar to uh, codes that we use here for behavior therapy and also for uh, general psychology, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, it obviously depends if you're in network, but you know there's always added network benefits. Now, most of the time, you will not find this in any um, creative arts place that you know doesn't fall under the medical realm. Um, any independent place is probably paid out of pocket. Other avenues you could go uh, would be if you're you know have a child in school and you feel that the school's not providing you know the appropriate social skill opportunities. We do work with a lot of child study teams, and they may pay for a social skill group. There are families that have CMOs that will pay for uh, therapy. Um, if you are in a medical um, a rehab facility uh, to try to start up a program, if I went to a place and wanted to start up a program, there are ways that they could bill through insurance. Um, but I guess the, the general answer is that if you're seeking private services, you're probably going to pay out of pocket.
Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm going to, to go one more question then. Okay. You just triggered something for me. Uh, as it relates to an IEP, uh -huh. does, uh, are you, do you have any experience with having these kinds of services included as part of an IEP? Right. So this is what I mentioned about the, the state. New Jersey won't, doesn't want it included as an IEP. But uh, not at all. Okay. It's really state by state. When my internship was out of school in Maryland, and we music therapy was absolutely a part of everybody's IEP, and I believe in parts of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, what I've learned about New Jersey is that it is actually, while the state doesn't totally support it, um, schools, individual schools may support it more and could kind of juggle their budget lines a little bit and find. Um, you know, ways that they can that they can pay for it, but the state is not going to cover it in New Jersey. Okay. So do you find any more success between the public and the private uh, sector schools? Do Usually we find more success in the private schools. In the private, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. Okay. All right, then. I think um, we're out of time. I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much. A lot of great information, and um, I really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. And thank you. That, I'm going to turn this over back to Kelly. Thank you all for joining us on our webinar on creative arts. There is an exit survey which we need everyone attending to fill out. The webinar blog is now open and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site. Our next presentation, Impulse Control Problems and Tourette Syndrome, will be presented by Dr. Kathy Budman and is scheduled for April 9, 2014. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Ms. Nace, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. Thank you.